said, I, yes, I'm a mother of six, but four were born from my body. So yes, my fertility, but two are adopted from Haiti. So they were born out of my heart. So it's kind of like spiritual fertility. So whatever, you know. I'm so excited to be with you all tonight. He's just here. Do you feel it? He's here in your midst. That worship was powerful. What we declare with our words bring power. What goes forth with our words. So we are saying these. We're not just singing beautiful melodies or beautiful songs. We're declaring truth into the atmosphere. It says the word of God does not come back void. It comes back and it changes and transforms us who we are. We become what we worship. So when we have these times of worship, that is time for transformation for us. Let's just soak that in. Um, I love the part that I get to do tonight because I get just to tell you stories about my life. I don't have to give you like deep theological thinking, which is very good for you all, you know. And so the church says, the church um, listens, the people listen more to witnesses than they do teachers. So all I can tell you is my witness and how real God is to me. And just how personal he is to me. And I'm going to try not to cry. I'm just a crier. Just don't take offense. And I promise I won't do like the bubble snots or anything. I hope I don't. But anyway, we'll just go with it and just move on. And so just really talking about just the power of God and how he is personal. But the whole thing is I am doing something new. God is always inviting us to more. The Holy Spirit is always inviting to more. He is never stagnant. He's always moving us, and he's usually always making us uncomfortable. That is why we need a comforter, because God is moving us from glory to glory and changing us and transforming us. And sometimes it is good and brings glory. Sometimes it's painful and brings refinement, refinement, but he's always trying to do more. So jump back in. I grew up as a cradle Catholic. We went to Catholic school, yada, yada, yada. My parents were in a part of a charismatic um, kind of prayer group community. My brother and I used to make fun of them, especially when they were praying in tongues. We did this shit about a Honda, like made fun of them, all this kind of good stuff. And I remember saying to myself, I will never do that. You know, where you say, I will never. Every time I have said that, that never has come to pass in some way, shape, or form when it does to do that. So I remember um, when I was about 20 years old, I had pretty much hit rock bottom. I was um, designing things, working from Nordstrom, stuff like that. And I had broken up with this boy, and my parents had moved down to Florida. We were living in Atlanta. And I went down there, and I really encountered the Lord, and it became personal to me. So this amazing encounter with the Lord, he became really personal to me. And then my mom said, well, I would like you to come and do a Life in the Spirit seminar. And I said, okay, I will come, but I don't really want anyone praying over me. I don't want to go out and do not give me the gift of tongues. Brat. Just put brat on this forehead. You know, this is what I was going to do. So I even wore a short skirt to the life in the seminar thing. So if I would fall over, my skirt would go up and they wouldn't make sure that I'd fall over because it would be scandalous. You know what I mean? So I even did that, but it did not happen. So they prayed over me. I fell out in the spirit. They put a blanket over my thing so nobody would see anything. My mother had preparations. And so, and then I did not experience the gift of tongues. So I was like, oh, thank God, you know, because I was such a control freak because I wanted control. I wanted God, but only on my terms. Amen. So later that night, it was just a powerful experience. I felt that energy as like the catechism tells us, the Holy Spirit animated my life. He illuminated and became real in a powerful way. That night I was taking a shower, singing like a praise and worship song, and I started kind of speaking in tongues. Because, you know, you can't, you have to participate in it. God does your will. You have to participate in it. But one of the other things, and this is how sneaky and good God is. I love words. I also, I end up studying literature and theology, and I love words, and I love books. So when I was praying and speaking this language, the Lord really revealed to my heart that tongues is a prayer language. But it's a pure prayer language. This mouth that likes to gossip sometimes, lie a couple times, embellish maybe some, you know, was becoming a pure language. He was giving me another way to pray and other words. And it was just a powerful thing. It was a gift that I got, and it was so powerful, and I just loved to experience it. But still the control freak in me said, this is great. 
and I will experience God, and I love that people prayed over me, and I experienced the power of God, but I want to experience him in the sacraments like that. That was fine. That's where the Holy Spirit worked. But I want to experience where no one, t- no one lays hands on me and touches me. Then I want to experience God's Holy Spirit then. And then I will really believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. Brat. And so went to a Steubenville South conference. Was a chaperone for my mother. She was leading a youth group. And it was actually in Alexandria, Louisiana, where Bishop Sam Jacobs is. Awesome. Mm-hmm. And Bishop Sam Jacobs is a good family friend of ours. And my mom even told him, brat, over here, whatever. So we were doing it. So we were doing the Saturday night procession. And Bishop Sam is bleeding the monstrance out. Well, I was attending to a teenager that was having, you know, some things go on in her heart. And I was really ministering to her and just be present to her. So Bishop Sam was coming around with the monstrance. And my back was to him. So I didn't even realize the monstrance was coming, you know, like that it even needed a kneel. All of a sudden, I went out face forward. And I look up, and I just feel this peace, and I look up, and I turn around, there's Bishop Sam. (laughs) Monstrance. But it was the power of the gospel. And it wasn't about the demonstrative acts, or it wasn't about the gifts. It was about God pursuing me and touching me. It was about God asking me to give up control. And it was about God saying, what do you think my power looks like when I touch a human being? There's wonder and awe. There's peace. Hence, that bring a beautiful adventure and gift with the Holy Spirit. One of the best things about fellowshipping and walking with the gifts of the Holy Spirit is he's always pushing us, but there's always more. And he's always asking more of us, and he's always wooing us. Fast forward about um, 10 years later, maybe 12 years later. I'm really bad with math. All these kids, you know, I mean, I could, yeah, whatever. Just fast forward years later, we had just had my fourth child. Lily. Lily was about three or four months old, and an earthquake happened in Haiti. I will get through this story, I promise, without crying. So I had four, six and under. And I remember having a conversation with my husband saying, okay, pause, let's learn NFP really well for a little while. I am overwhelmed. I have three in diapers. (sighs) Take a break. The next week, the earthquake happens. Friends of ours were missionaries down there. They called us and told us they came across these two kids, a 13-year-old little girl and a 16-month little boy. His parents were killed in the earthquake. Did we know anyone in the United States that could take them because they were getting children out for, with the relief visas? I said, no, we don't know of anyone right now, but I'll send an email out. So I sent an email out, whatever. And then after two or three days of praying, God just, it was that invitation in my heart. And I gave all the excuses why we shouldn't. But none of my excuses compare to God's invitation that he was doing something bigger. So lo and behold, my husband comes home from work one day. I'm crying. I think we're supposed to be the family that takes these kids. And I said, this is the woman that just said, hold on last week. I know, but ignore what I said last week, I think. So hence started the adoption process for the kids in Haiti. It was grueling. It was exhausting. And the process was long. We were not able to get them out on a humanitarian visa. Therefore, we had to start the whole process and go again. So it was exhausting. It took us 18 months total to get them home. In that time, my husband went down there four times. I went down there two. I went down the last time right before we would bring them home. And it was very hard for me to go home over there to Haiti to see these kids and then to leave. So the last time that I went there... I was there for five or six days. So David, who was only 17, 18 months at the time, you know, the first two days I was like building up his trust so he would come to me and whatever. So by the time I was left, he had come, you know, trusted me and he loved me and he would hold on to me and I would comfort him. And then I had to leave. And it was heartbreaking. And so I remember telling him with our older daughter, Algain, she was 13, so she had some kind of understanding. Like, we're almost done with the process. I will be back. The lawyers are almost done. We're hoping it's only going to be six more weeks. At least there was some thing. You know, there's no reasoning with a 17-month-year-old. So when I was leaving back to go home, I looked at David. I took him separate in a separate place from the orphanage. I looked at him, knowing that he couldn't understand what I'm saying, but I just had to speak to his spirit and speak to him. And I got down on his level, and I looked at him, and I held his face, 
and said, you don't understand what I'm saying. I have to leave, but I will come back for you. Do you understand me? I am not abandoning you. I will come back for you. And your mother and your father love you. And we are moving heaven and earth to get you home where you belong. Then I handed him off, got in the car, got on a plane. I remember walking on the plane in Port-au-Prince, and me and God were going. Like, seriously, Lord, this stinks. You called us to this process, and this is heartbreaking. How could this be good for you, this child? That I mean, all I wanted him is home and in my arms, and you had me keep him leaving? And it was one of those times where you know that you know that you know that it is the Lord, because it is so clear in your heart. And the Lord felt like said to my spirit, he said, now you know how I feel about you. That I would move heaven and earth to have you in my arms and have you home. The spirit gives us the ability to say, Abba, Father. Like we just sung tonight, his love is relentless. It will chase the 99 it will break down any wall to get to you. The Father's love, that is how he feels about us. And what the Holy Spirit has done through adoption, has it been easy? Heck no, it's probably one of the hardest things we've ever done. Adopting kids from hard places with trauma, it's hard. Has it been beautiful? Absolutely. Has it shown us what the Father's love is in ways that I never could imagine? My older daughter has experienced a lot of trauma before we got her because she was 13. And this is part of her story. And so about last year, there was just some more bumps in the road. And I was really praying for her. And I was negotiating with the Lord. Does anyone else do that? I like to negotiate. And so if you just get her to this point, Lord, that'll be okay. Just get her to this point. That will be okay. And the Lord, I really felt like this time he was saying to me, like, I am like United States. I don't negotiate with terrorists, and I don't negotiate with you. This is how this is going to go. <laughs> and the Lord convicted me so hard, and he said, don't bother praying for this if you do not pray for this child's total restoration and healing. Stop praying small prayers for her. Stop praying for little crumbs when I want to give you a banquet feast. I want her total healing and restoration, so stop praying for anything less. And then he brought me to the wedding at Cana, where Jesus did his first miracle. And he said, when I provided the wine, it wasn't the cheap wine, it was the very best. So when I provide a miracle, I will provide the best miracle. So as usually it goes, I repented and I said I was sorry and we moved on and, it's just, and just convicted to pray bigger and pray bolder because that is the kind of God he, we have. Now, does it, what does it look like? I don't know. I'm still waiting, you know, but that is the kind of God we have. Fast forward to this February. Sister Miriam and I were actually at a non-denominational conference together. And it was an amazing conference. And we were the token Catholics at the conference, but it was an amazing conference. And while we were there, it was very hard not to covet. You know what I mean? The aesthetics were gorgeous. It looked like an anthropology catalog when you walk in. The music was amazing. The speaking was awesome. I mean, we have all of this here, too. But there was also just like a real hunger for mission and discipleship, a real activation. It was a real just powerhouse. And I'm watching it, and I keep on thinking, but we have the Eucharist, but we have the Eucharist, but we have the Eucharist. You know, that mantra you keep on telling yourself, you know, because you're like, okay, I will not covet. And so we, we end up leaving that first night of the conference, and I, we are in the hotel room, and the Lord wakes me up at 2 a.m. in the morning. And it was one of those times where he would not let me sleep and where, you know, you, you want to, like, hit the snooze Holy Spirit button. But he's like, uh-uh. It was, like, blaring. And he was praying, and he was praying, and he was praying about the church, the Catholic church. And he said, she is your mother, and you love her. But she is the sleeping bride. But you cannot prophesy over what you want her to be if you are criticizing her. And I will not allow you to bring her to revival 
if you are critical of her. And he reminded me of a principle. Repentance leads to revival. I had to get on my face and repent the ways that I had criticized the church. I had to get on my face and repent the ways that I had been critical of my priest. And the Lord showed me even the attitude towards some priests that I was like an absentee wife in a marriage. It says, we are the bride, the priest is the groom, persona Christi, but we feel like it is all their responsibility. Are we not? Well, the priest is not doing this. Well, the priest is not doing this. Did you hear him doing that? Is it just me? Does anyone else do that? Okay, maybe it's just me. But seriously. (laughs) And the Lord said, you pray for them. And you love them. And you call out, especially, and I'm speaking to the women here. Women, in our very nature, we are life bearers. That is who we are. We come from Eve, which means life bearers. We bring life. Our mouths have the power of life and death. And there's something about a mother and a woman calling out what men should be, who should they should be, that is powerful. Our prophetic words are powerful to call them into existence. But the Lord will not call life and death out of the same mouth. So the Lord said, will you repent? And I have. And I'm going, and it's not easy some days. But I'm starting to see, he's showing me little glimmers of that sleeping beauty coming to life. And I think it's especially powerful for women. I'm not excluding the men. But only, usually a woman gets a bride ready for the bridegroom. Ready for the wedding feast. Men usually are off at war. Sorry. (laughs) Have fun. But, you know. But it's our power in our words. And it's a power in the thing. At the last point, what I feel like the Lord is doing, and I feel like he's doing in my life, and he's stirring also, I feel like in the last couple of probably months, there's a shift. Things seem to be getting darker, but the spirit seems to be amping up more. And the Spirit seems to be revealing himself more. And the Spirit seems to be making himself tangible more. And see, the Lord is saying, I want to do something new. So if the Lord is doing something new, that means he is going to strip us of the old. And the beautiful thing about the Catholic Church is we have these traditions But do these traditions are supposed to root us, not confine us? So if we are saying the way that we pray or we are saying that we do something, if you were saying these words that come out of your mouth, but we have always done it this way. That's really probably not new wine and new wineskin. The Lord is doing something new. So our traditions... Root us to grow and grow in a different way. The fruit is going to look different. Same spirit, same church, same teaching, but a different fruit. So it is going to make us uncomfortable. I love what Pope Francis says. He said the Holy Spirit makes us uncomfortable, but he calls us to move. And we want to domesticate the Holy Spirit. We're fine as long as the Holy Spirit fits into a box and we can control him. But really, we don't want that control. We want an all-consuming fire. We want an all-consuming fire. We want fresh wind to do that. But that means a lot of shaking. That means a lot of repentance. That means a lot of refinement. But that means a lot of saving. That means a lot of salvation. That means a lot of restoration and a lot of redemption. But they all go together. So will we give him the permission? Will we give him the way to make new wine and new wineskins? Father Michael Scanlon, that man can make me cry. I was blessed to be at this university. I was blessed to be a student here. I was blessed to have him as a spiritual director, and I was blessed to have him marry my husband and I. He used to call me highly favored brat and our spiritual direction. I don't know where he got that from. Um, 
the name fat. But he would always tell me, Michelle, ask for the fire. It'll burn you at first and refine you a little, but ask for the fire. He always used to tell me that. Give the Holy Spirit permission, Michelle. Give the Holy Spirit permission. <laughs> Satan in his nice little Boston voice. It was interesting after his death, it was last year, it was great because actually the day that he died, it was out to be with Father Dave and actually Bob Rice. We were all at another event together. And it was good because I think it, all of us were kind of like Father Mike's kids. And it was good to be together. But I remember I had spiritual direction the week after he died. And I just remember just telling him, like, that just this loss. I knew it was coming, but it was lost because he really spiritually fathered me in so many ways. My father was not present in my life emotionally. And Father Mike stepped in and really re-fathered me in so many ways. And that is the power of a spiritual father. Amen. Amen. Just such a gift. And I remember my spiritual, I mean, my spiritual director saying to me, he said, Michelle, you have greater access to him now than you did when he was in Steubenville. And I always love the story Esther. Esther is a big deal for me. When people have prayed with me and over me, it's always Esther. So my spiritual director said, he's your Mordecai now up in heaven. And I loved that image. But he always said what he created here and what he did here is he allowed the Holy Spirit to have complete permission. He did not know what it was going to look like. He did not even care that there wasn't a structure for it to happen. He just gave the Holy Spirit and he said yes. But what we have now is those little embers and those little flames that are burning right now. And there's people like Father Mike and there's people like the Archbishop here that have these little flames. And they're asking us to put our stick in and allow it to be bonfires and to burn and to get stronger and to go out. And to move. And to make us uncomfortable, but allow us to be on this adventure with the Holy Spirit. So I've really been praying into that for the last um, probably two or three months. The Holy Spirit has just changed something. I can feel this igniting in you. So about six weeks ago, I was preaching at another conference, actually my diocese. And I gave a talk. And it was, I was a little spicy, that talk. I would admit, yes, there was a little spice some fire coming out of my mouth. And I came off the stage, and this man, older man in his mid-70s, came up to me and said, girl, you just have an anointing on you. I haven't heard someone preach that in a long time. He's like, you know what? Actually, last time I heard someone preach was in Eastern Europe in the late 1990s, a, fa- a fire rally. Father Michael Scanlon, have you ever heard of him? You just <laughs> preach just like him. This poor man, I was so hormonal that day. Sorry, man. I was so hor- I started bawling. I just bawled and bawled and bawled. And it was, but it was just such a testament. It was just such a testament that the same spirit, the same fire keeps on going. But it's our openness to the same spot, fire and the same spirit. So this weekend, this evening, this time is a landmark. I just told you three landmark stories in my life, but this, that the Holy Spirit moved. But I really feel like this time in the season, Lord, that has people here, this is a landmark moment in your relationship with the Holy Spirit. Are we going to give him permission? Are we going to allow him to make us uncomfortable? Are we going to allow his, let his kindness lead us to repentance? Are we going to speak words of life and allow the sleeping beauty of the church to rise in her splendor that she is supposed to be? Are we going to be the catalyst or the hindrance? Because we have a father that is so chasing us relentless with Lee with his love, and he just wants us to join him in the adventure. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Sweet Spirit, we just thank you and praise you that you are a God that is relentless. 
We just thank you and praise you that you are a God that goes after the one and leaves the 99. We just thank you that you are a God that calls each and every person here by name. That you are a God that is personal. That you are a God that moves in power. And that you are a God that illuminates our lives. That you have more for us. That you are a God that has the best provision and the best restoration, the best redemption plan that we could ever dream or imagine, Lord. And all you are doing is waiting for is our yes. So, Lord, allow us to open our hands, open our mouths, open our hearts, and say yes to your Holy Spirit. We just say yes to your invitation. We say yes to more. We say yes to being that catalyst, that spark of fire to bring revival, not only in our own souls, but in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and in our church. Lord, have your way with us. Lord, have your way with us. We pray all this in Jesus' most holy and precious and powerful name. Amen.